Well, hello and good afternoon, good evening, or good morning, depending on where you're joining us from today. Welcome to Engineering for Change, or E4C for short. Today we're pleased to bring you the latest in our 2017 webinar series on the topic of innovation in microgrids. My name is Yana Aranda, and I'm the president of Engineering for Change. The webinar you're participating in today is part of E4C's professional development offerings. Information on upcoming webinars in the series, as well as archived videos of past presentations, can be found on the E4C webinars webpage, as well as on our YouTube channel. You can see both of these URLs listed on the slide here. If you have any questions, comments, and recommendations for future topics and speakers, please contact the E4C webinar series team at webinars at engineeringforchange.org. If you're following us on Twitter today, I encourage you to join us on the conversation with our dedicated hashtag, hashtag E4C webinars. Before we move on to our moderator and presenters, I'd like to tell you a bit about Engineering for Change. E4C is a knowledge organization and global community of over 1 million engineers, designers, development practitioners, and social scientists who are leveraging technology to solve quality of life challenges faced by underserved communities. Some of these challenges may include access to clean water and sanitation, sustainable energy, improved agriculture, access to information and internet, and more. We invite you to become a member. E4C membership is free and provides access to news, information on hundreds of essential technologies in our solutions library, professional development resources, and information on opportunities such as jobs, conferences, funding calls, and fellowships. Members enjoy a unique user experience based on their site behavior and engagement. Essentially, the more you interact with the E4C site, the better we will be able to serve you resources aligned to your interests. For more information, please see our website to sign up and explore. Now, a few housekeeping edits before we get started. Let's practice using the WebEx platform by sharing where in the world you are joining us today. In the chat window, which is located at the bottom right of your screen, please type in your location. Note, if the chat is not open on your screen, you can just click the chat icon on the top right corner. And I'm going to go ahead and type in my location. I'm dialing in today from Brooklyn, New York. And let's see where folks are from. And I see we have participants from Toronto, participants from Chicago. I see some folks coming in from India. We have a few from the United States. Thank you so much for joining us. We're so pleased that you've made it today. Please know you can use this window to share remarks during the webinar. And if you have any technical questions, just send a private chat to the Engineering for Change admin. During the webinar, please use the Q&A window, which is located below the chat, to type in your questions for the presenter. Again, if you don't see that window, you can just click the Q&A icon in the top right corner of WebEx. If you're listening to the audio broadcast and encounter any trouble, try hitting stop and then start. You may also want to try opening up WebEx in a different browser. E4C webinars qualify engineers for one professional development hour. To request your PDH, please follow the instructions on the top of the E4C professional development page after this presentation. The URL is listed on the slide. And a special note about today's webinar. We will actually end at 15 minutes past the hour, or 12.15 Eastern Standard Time, to ensure that we have enough time for Q&A with our incredible panelists. And with that, I'd like to take a moment to introduce you to our moderator for today. Frank Berg is the VP of Grid Engineering for Segura International, with experience in renewable energy in a variety of contexts from community-driven systems to utility-scale power plants. He's an instructor for Villager, teaching web-based courses on appropriate technology and community-based development at Colorado State University. He's been an active leader within Engineers Without Borders USA since 2005, and Frank is also a contributing editor at E4C and has been with us for over three years. You can follow Frank on Twitter, uh, his handle is right there, but also on the E4C platform. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Frank to introduce our panelists. 
Well, thanks, Yana, and, and welcome to participants um, from all over the world. As, as Yana mentioned, uh, my name is Frank Berg. I'm a contributing editor uh, with Engineering for Change, um, and you can find some more of my thoughts on the blog. Um, I want to introduce today's presenters, um, Henry Louie, um, President and Co-Founder of Kilowatts for Humanity, Omer Ghani, CEO of Kilowatt Labs, and Jay Taneja from uh, Assistant Professor of Electrical and Computer Engineering at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. Um, in order to start the conversation today, I'd like to um, just kind of introduce the concepts of uh, electrical microgrids um, in the context of energy access and rural electrification. Um, first of all, uh, Segura International, uh, my employer, is, is a company that uh, builds uh, micro utility business models uh, by building the, the grid from scratch in, in places that have never had power. Um, the photo here is from uh, is one of our technicians in the grid that we built in Northwest Haiti. Um, we currently provide uh, electricity and keep the lights on um, for about 10,000 customers in three towns in Northwest Haiti, growing every day. Um, in order to set some of the context um, for this discussion, um, I'd like to point out um, that uh, there's a high cost to darkness. Um, people without access to reliable electricity pay far more um, per unit of energy than folks with reliable electric connections. Um, as you can see on the left half of the slide, um, folks without grid access pay uh, upwards of $10 a kilowatt hour for um, lighting, if you do some math from dollars per watt and watts per lumen, um, and 20 to $50 um, for cell phone charging when they're charging um, you know, on the street at a vendor or, or traveling to the nearest electric grid or generator. Um, on the right side of the slide, you have the uh, average uh, rates of electricity in all of the countries in the European Union, as well as the average price in, in the United States, uh, as well as the average price uh, for the national utility in Haiti. Um, and, and, and as you can see, the, it's, it's 100 times lower for customers connected to a conventional grid than customers who are using subsistence electricity um, on a to which you're self basis. Um, you know, the difference is 10 US dollars versus 10 cents of a US dollar, roughly, um, from one to the other. So, so the, the punchline here is that poverty is expensive. Uh, in fact, 100 times uh, more expensive than uh, conventional grid connections to existing grids. So oftentimes folks will say, well, you know, the problem with microgrids is we, we can't afford them, when the reality is that our customers are actually paying uh, 100 times more um, for what little electricity or, or uh, energy that they do consume. So there is a ability and willingness to pay for some electrical services. The, the, next, the next concern that, that I often hear is uh, that um, but basically uh, that, that these projects are not financeable uh, or that, that the investment uh, would be better spent elsewhere. And, and to this, I'd, I'd just like to, to share some experience from um, the context of uh, utility companies operating in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, looking at uh, the slide, the chart in the center shows uh, the capital uh, expenditures in green and the operating expenditures in purple for each of the 39 countries in sub-Saharan Africa for their electrical utility. Um, in many cases, these utilities are, are nationally owned, but in, in some contexts, there's uh, multiple privately owned utilities in a, in a country. The, the red dot in each bar uh, represents the uh, cash collected um, as, a, as a percentage of uh, total expenditures. And you'll see only two out of 39 countries are able to cover both capital and operating expenditures with the cash they collect. Um, so what that means is that um, the business as usual in, in sub-Saharan Africa electric utilities is insolvent. Um, the costs are either subsidized or not fully reflected uh, in the prices that customers pay, or energy theft has resulted in the inability to recover the revenue that it takes to run these businesses. So it's not that microgrids are not financially viable, it's that electricity as practiced in developing nations is, is not financially viable. And I would say that there are plenty, this chart illustrates there are plenty of room for improvement in terms of uh, the way that we um, build, operate, maintain, and collect payment for electrical services in the developing world. Um, the, the picture there, Munoz Suaf Courant, is the 
unofficial motto of Segura Haiti. Uh, that's a painting on the wall of our of our office in Molson Nicola Haiti. Uh, and it means in Haitian Creole it means the people are thirsty for power. And it's true that people in developing countries need modern electricity access uh, for many uh, productive uses of power from irrigation to refrigeration uh, to water purification. Um, all many many different aspects of, of everyday life, uh, including healthcare and education, uh, are are much more viable with reliable service to electricity. But these types of business models and uh, business as usual um, is not getting us there. The the cost per connection of grid extension um, is not reaching these uh, these customers uh, as quickly as they need the power, and uh, individual solutions. Um, for a variety of reasons, don't meet the needs of productive use. Um, so hence the interest uh, here in microgrid, like the one um, being built in the background of the uh, of the picture on the right. Again, that's from our system in Haiti. Um, so one of the questions that our panelists will be grappling with today um, is the uh, how do we measure the impact of uh, electrification in this context? Um, and so here's the slide of a couple a couple of the metrics and frameworks that have been put forward um, to analyze uh, and compare these these different systems. So on the left, um, you have uh, tiered access to electricity structure from ESMAP, um, and it basically ranks different. It helps to quantify different levels of electrification from tier zero, which is essentially no electrical infrastructure, um, to you know tier one, tier two, basically solar lanterns. Um, basically, uh, you know, a flashlight with a solar panel on the back of it, um, and you know, tier three and four, you know, solar home systems, um, and tier five uh, or tiers four and five, um, you know, microgrid systems uh, with varying degrees of reliability, uh, uptime, and and energy access. Um, this is a framework that that's been put forward, um, basically, to compare different levels of electrification. Certainly. There's a different price point for a solar home system versus a full uh, utility scale grid, um, but uh, but also there's different levels of of use. And and on the right is the quality assurance framework for mini grids. It's been put forward by um, the National Renewable Energy Lab here in the U.S., which um, basically takes some of what the ESMAP standards were were trying to accomplish, but puts it into more technical terminology um, using more standard. Um, metrics from the utility industry um, to measure um, reliability standards and uh, kind of normalize um, across the different uh, different metrics how we can compare these from one to another um, so that was just my uh, quick quick words of uh, of introduction here to kind of set the tone for the importance of microgrids in developing countries and the discussion we're going to have today so without further ado, I'll get out of the way and I'll pass the mic over to our first panelist, Dr. Henry Louis, the founder of Kilowatt for Humanity and uh, professor of engineering at Seattle University. Yeah, hello uh, and good morning, everyone. I hope you can hear me. Frank, could you maybe just check that you can hear me? Yeah, I got you. Loud and clear. Okay, thank you so much. So, uh, yeah, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, my name is Henry Louis, and as uh, our illustrious moder moderator Frank uh, said, I'm a professor at Seattle University, and I am a practitioner involved in the off-grid electrification space through my nonprofit organization called Kilowatts for Humanity. We work in rural areas, primarily in Zambia, but also Kenya and a few other places to provide electricity access through an energy kiosk model as well as sustainable business opportunities. Um, I've spent uh, quite a bit of time in Zambia. I was there for uh, a year continuously as part of the Fulbright uh, program where I worked in electrification and electricity access in general. Let's go to the next slide, please. So when we think about those tiers that Frank had mentioned, uh, the different levels of access that have been defined by ESMAP and adopted by a few other organizations, uh, you can really map some technologies to that level to each level each tier of electricity access and i would say that sort of on the the low end of it would be solar lanterns by the various providers uh, there's some, some estimates that there's a there's something like 40 million of these units that have been 
uh, sold over the last couple of years, and they provide a, a, a very modest amount of electricity access, maybe one or two LED lights and some cell phone charging. As we move up this this curve, you see that this, the systems become more capable and sophisticated. You might have improvised microgrids or what you might call unengineered microgrids that you would see in someone's house. Maybe they run a little wire to their neighbor and it's powered off an uh, automotive battery or something like that. Uh, higher quality systems might be called filler home systems. These are usually well-engineered products. They might be costing hundreds of dollars and they might be capable of providing uh, lights, radios, even television access. Um, and moving up further, you might have energy kiosks. Uh, these would serve a, a small uh, village, not necessarily through direct connection, but it would serve as an energy access point where there might be some refrigeration. There might be a place for people to recharge car, their, their solar batteries, car batteries, or cell phones. And really, there's some productive uses that can be associated with that. Energy kiosks are typically in the few kilowatt range. As we move up further, we get into the mini grid or microgrid space. Uh, and really, the distinction between a mini and a microgrid isn't really clear. Um, so I'm going to use it sort of generically here and call them mini grids. But these would typically be maybe five kilowatts up to a few hundred kilowatts in size. And they serve uh, wired connections to to lots and lots of customers, uh, dozens to hundreds of customers. And then sort of at the top would be the, the grid. And the caveat here would be that in some cases, and in fact a lot of cases, a well-engineered mini grid will outperform the existing grid, the national grid, in terms of reliability. So those two might overlap um, if we look at the, the quality of access. So let's move on to the next slide here, please. One of the things that we do in my organization, we don't own any of our, our systems. Rather, we have a nonprofit organization in, in the local community that actually does the, that actually ends up owning it and operating it. And I think some advice I would give to anyone involved in this off-grid electrification space would be that you have to pay attention to the, the economics. It, it sounds obvious, but anything that you do, any panel that you install or battery that you install, it's going to fail. So you need to have a, you need to be thinking about how you're going to pay to replace it, how you're going to pay your operating costs if you have salary. So here are just some images of, of ways that we've seen energy be used in, in productive ways from cell phone charging to making ice, preserving fish. Uh, at the bottom there, you'll see wired distribution to, to homes, and you can charge, as Frank had mentioned, varying tariffs uh, that will help you recoup your costs. Um, we found that Selling cold sodas has been very popular, generally with a very high profit margin, and a lot of our partners end up doing that. And then there's some more creative uses. What you see on the, the bottom right of the screen is like a movie night that they they show. So they they, they have a projector, they, they show movies on that white sheet that you see there, and they charge a small fee for people that want to come and watch the show. So you always need to be thinking about the, the uh, economics. Let's move on to the next slide. Thank you. So this is going to be an animated slide. So how we actually do mini grid designs is the two main inputs really are some sort of estimation of your demand and some sort of estimation of your resource. And this is true whether or not it's solar or wind or even biomass or hydro. You need to know your input energy source. You take your demand and you take your solar resource in this example, and you might apply computer simulation, or you might apply an IEEE or an IEC standard, or maybe your organization has some sort of rule of thumb standard that you apply. Uh, and, and from all this, you would output, please advance the animation for me. Thank you. You end up getting some sense of the, size, the sizes of your components and costs. So if you use, for example, Homer, um, at the end of the day, when you're done doing your analysis, you'll have the approximate sizes of the the major equipment, uh, the the inverters, the batteries, solar panels, et cetera, and and that's how we do things. Let's do one more animation for me, please. So usually, getting the the resource input is easy if it's solar. You can just consult a database. It's a bit more tricky, for example, if you have a wind powered system. But you would set up a MET tower or you would uh, try to find some historical data to get an idea of your resource. So it's, it's fairly easy to get, to get hard numbers on your energy resource. Um, let's do one more animation, please. 
Estimating the load, however, is, is very tricky. Uh, really, the state of practice that, that many organizations use is to do surveys where you go and you talk to the potential customers and you ask them what sort of appliances they might want to own and you figure out how many hours a day they might want to use it and you look at the power rating of, of different appliances and then you sort of come up with an estimate of the their energy use. And then you design your system around that, as you can see. Now, there's a lot of problems with this approach. Um, people who have never had access to electricity, I think, are very poor at estimating what amount of electricity they might actually use. It's aspirational, it's very predictive and, and speculative. In addition, if there's a tariff associated with the electricity, it's really hard to figure out what that the demand elasticity looks around the different pricing points. So I think this is a, a, an area that is that is uh, prone to error. Let's move on to the next slide. Thank you. And there's actually some very meaningful consequences of this error. If you happen to overpredict, meaning you predict that each customer is going to use more than they actually do, then essentially you've oversized your system and uh, most of the components, their costs scale approximately linearly, and some estimates put it at about a, uh, the penalty for oversizing being somewhere around $6 per watt hour of error, and that adds up considerably. What this means is that for a given amount of budget or investment, you can only install fewer uh, systems. So if you were off by 100% uh, in your error, you were only, to only able to install about half as many systems, and, and that's a, a real a real uh, challenge for, for companies and organizations trying to make good use of their dollars. As a consequence, you need to really charge more, more money. You have to take that capital expense and spread it over fewer watt hours sold. On the other hand, if you tend to underpredict, so you, you, you predict less than what is actually needed in terms of uh, energy use, well, then your system is smaller. Um, you spend less money on it, but the reliability probably isn't where you want it to be. And this can drive um, premature failure because batteries are cycled deeper and so forth. And, and you can actually lose some customers. You can see some customers defect from your, from your mini grid if you uh, don't price it. So some of the research that we've done, uh, please go to the next slide, is to look at just how bad this survey-based error is. And this is some work that we, worked, that we did with the Vulcan Inc on some of their, their mini grids in Kenya. And you can see this bar chart shows uh, the results of that survey, that predicted amount of energy and the actual, and this is for eight different uh, mini grids uh, in, in Kenya. And you can see that there's a, a strong bias towards over predicting act, uh, consumption. And in fact, if you show the next animation for me, you'll see that the total predicted, if we look at this as a portfolio of mini grids, would have been about 72 uh, kilowatt hours per day, but the actual was much lower. It was, it was only 17 kilowatt hours per day. So the capital expenses were, were bloated and the, the grids ended up being much larger than, than uh, they needed to be. To give you an idea, the average consumption ended up being somewhere around 100 watt hours a day. And I, I believe this, this sort of estimate is, um, agrees with what one of my, my uh, co-panelists will be talking about a little bit later. Now, as we looked at this data, we noticed, and, it, and the next animation, please, would be helpful, that the actual uses were fairly similar. So there's one grid that, that sort of overachieved in their consumption, but the rest were fairly close to one another. And that led a... Um, led us to conclude that actually a best, the better way of predicting mini grid consumption is to actually just take a data-driven approach. And I'll show you what that looks like on the next slide. So here on this data-driven approach, what you do is you simply, you uh, consult the database and you basically compute the, compute the average con uh, per, per person or per, per household consumption and simply use that to predict the future mini grid um, consumption. And when we applied, applied this approach, um, and do the next animation for me, please, we were able to reduce the, the error. So I think this, this really opened our eyes to the possibility of, of um, what data can do. And if these results are, are known and we start sharing our experiences as an industry of what we think consumptions are, then I think we can really reduce our costs a bit. And there's actually a lot of other things you can do if you have access to data. If you go to the next slide, uh, please. 
Now, this is just one example from one of our systems. Um, here we can see the solar power, the load, and battery voltage for a, a week-long period. This is for an energy kiosk in Philly Baba. And if you show the first animation, please. Yeah, you see that if we look at the battery voltage, there's a certain level where it's the battery we can conclude is full or nearly full, and it's somewhere right around 28 volts for this system. Uh, keep keep going with the animation, please. Uh, and then let's go ahead and keep going with the next uh, two animations, yeah. And then at the lower end, there's a range in which the low voltage disconnect will happen. And generally speaking, you do not want this to happen because it means you're cycling your batteries. Uh, but this this can happen depending on how you size your system. And in this case, we see that we do drop below the low voltage disconnect. And it really has to do with the the cloudy days that you see in the solar power uh, time series. So I have a, a call out in the next animation, please. So several cloudy days in a row, as well as a uh, little bit higher than average demand, has caused the system to um, to lose its its uh, load. And you can see in the next animation I point out where the inverter load basically goes to zero during those times. So having this data, we can we can diagnose the problem. We can look at at what caused these power outages, which is a lot easier to support than just getting a phone call in the middle of the night saying the power went out, what happened? We don't have to send somebody on site to troubleshoot it. We know uh, that it's simply an imbalance of energy in and energy out. And you can see towards the end of the week after we've asked people to try to limit their evening load that the battery is able to uh, become fully charged again. So let's go to the next slide, please. So I think data acquisition is is uh, a must-have now in these mini-grids. Uh, I think a lot of practitioners are using it and um, it, it helps with the design, it helps with de-risking investment, so we can sort of unlock finance for mini grids. If we can show how much our grids produce, then uh, it should be able to e you know, more easily attract invest investment. Operational decision-making, knowing when to shed load, for example, is something that can be done if you have um, these data acquisition systems. For my organization, we're a nonprofit. It's very useful for us to be transparent and say, uh, to, to donors and funders, um, you know, our grids have produced X amount of megawatt hours, uh, here's the reliability, and, and so forth. And of course, it can be used for research and education. Uh, so let's move on to the next uh, slide here. This is just my uh, ways to reach out to me. Uh, you'll notice that there is a, web, uh, a link there at www.kw4h.org where you can access our real-time data. And I'll show you what that looks like briefly on the next slide before I end here. Thank you. So we have a data dashboard where you can uh, look at how our different grids are performing. Um, sometimes there's communication problems and you'll see, see no data for some period of time, uh, but you can always browse back in, in time and see how our grids have been performing. Um, if you're interested, maybe you're a researcher, maybe your organization has some, some interest in wanting to have the, the minutely data that we store, you can send me an email, as you see there uh, at the bottom, and I'm happy to share the data with you. In addition, I'm part of the IEEE Power and Energy Society Working Group, where we're creating a data archive for, for this type of information, and you see the link there. And you can contact me um, via email if maybe your organization has some, some data uh, that you want to, to share with us. So uh, just one last slide here for our, the references um, that you might find interesting if you found part of my talk interesting here. And with that, I'll end my, my, um, my 15 minutes. And uh, I guess, Frank, uh, it's back to you. Yeah. Thanks, Dr. Louie. Great job on the presentation. It's really good for our, our audience to hear some direct field experience and, and kind of what this has been like in your applications in, in Zambia. So um, with that, I'm going to pass uh, the mic over to our next panelist, Jay Taneja, who is an assi assistant professor of electrical and computer engineering at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. So Jay, take it away. Great. Thank you very much, Frank. And uh, I appreciate your content as well as Henry's content. I think they lead in very well to my presentation. So uh, good morning, good evening, good afternoon to everybody uh, on the webinar. Uh, happy to uh, to uh, discuss this with you today. So uh, I want to uh, talk today about that, that measurement problem that uh, Henry so very well described. And this is uh, essentially work that, that uh, I, I want to share work that uh, I've done in concert with 
uh, uh, some students, some teams at Columbia University, as well as our partners at Kenya Power, looking specifically at measuring the growth in electricity consumption among grid and many grid customers in Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, so this work, uh, you know, just, just background-wise, we, we see two very different pictures of electrification across the continent. Uh, if we're looking at, uh, on a country basis, the, the map on the left here shows the electrification in urban areas. And generally, urban areas across the continent tend to have somewhat better electrification, you know, 70%, uh, but it varies from lower regions in the 20s and 30% all the way up. Uh, and then in rural areas, you have a very different story. You often have very low electrification. Across the continent, the average is about 5%. And what, why is this? Well, uh, we know that the continent is quite large, uh, and that means you have a very sparse grid. So you can't actually reach all areas very well with a single interconnected grid. Uh, but I, the couple of factors I really want to point out here are uh, that you have very high grid connection costs. These costs can be uh, anywhere from uh, $100 to $1,000 for connecting individual customers to the grid. And uh, in many cases, that, that is beyond the reach of the consumer that, that actually wants that electricity connection. In places where those connections already exist, you still have a challenge where demand for electricity often outstrips supply. And so... Uh, this results in frequent grid outages, and you also have older equipment that can result in unplanned grid outages. So when you're looking at these two situations, urban and rural, you have kind of a key challenge in each one that, that we're highlighting. One is reliability in urban contexts, and in rural contexts, the, the question is really how you can provide low-cost access that fits the needs of these consumers. Next slide, please. So the big question, how much will these new electricity consumers use once, once they get connected and how will that, that consumption develop over time? Uh, so Professor Louis talked about uh, the challenges in making those estimations. And I would say that you know, it, it's a challenge for anybody to predict how much electricity they're going to use. Uh, in general, this isn't a, a quantity that we're used to how, uh, how we can, and can quantify it. It's, it's hard to say what one kilowatt hour actually is. So. Uh, the challenge, and we, we take this data-driven approach that, that um, Henry so, so well uh, described, and so what we did is, uh, if you can advance the next slide, we worked with a data set from Kenya Power that looked at 160,000 utility customers. And why are we looking at utility customers, and why are we looking at customers that are already on the grid? Well, these customers are our greatest guide to understand how new customers, when they get connected, will use electricity. And we took these customers and we built a classification algorithm that's able to uh, identify which customers are in urban areas, which customers are in peri-urban areas, and which customers are in rural areas. And really, when we're thinking about energy access, we really have to focus on these rural customers. These are customers that are as similar as possible to the next set of customers that are going to be connected. Most areas on the continent, as we notice, uh, that are unconnected are rural areas. This is where electricity access is quite low. And so that, by, by focusing on these rural customers, we want to understand what the electricity access and consumption patterns will be like for the next set of customers that are coming online. Next slide, please. So uh, first looking at consumption among all customers. We, we, this is for, uh, for the entire data set of 160,000. We actually have data over a number of years. And so this shows that for the first 10 years that a customer has had electricity, uh, the red line here represents the median. So this is your typical customer. And the dotted lines above and below the median represent your, thir your third quartile and your first quartile. And so this really shows this distribution. The, when a customer starts out, they generally start with very low consumption. We're talking three to five kilowatt hours per month. As that, you see very fast growth in the, in the initial year, uh, and then the growth slows down, but it continues all the way through 10 years. And this is as long as our data set could tell us, but we see kind of very good and stable growth among, among customers who have, electricity cons uh, who have an electricity connection on the grid. Next slide, please. So honing in a little bit more, the story isn't quite as rosy. So this is for rural customers only. So looking only at those customers that represent our, our set of customers we're interested in for, for electricity access. And in particular, we're looking at customers who received their electricity connections in different years. So if a customer received their electricity connection in 2009, we have something like six to seven years of data for them given our data set. And that's that red line you see at the very top. And so for those customers, 
uh, we see that their their consumption peaks right at the beginning and, and then starts to uh, to level out. In fact, they reach their peak at around three years of having an electricity connection. And that peak is in the 30 to 35 kilowatt hour per month range. Uh, and so uh, as we look at future years, we look at 2010, 2011, and so on, we have Fewer data for each for each group of customers, so that's why the lines are shorter. But we also notice two very important changes in, in these customer bases. One, that the customers are peaking at lower levels, so the, the, the height of where their consumption goes is progressively lower as the customer has had, uh, as the newer customers are coming online. And they're peaking earlier in their in their experience with electricity. So customers are peaking after 12 months instead of 36 months. This has something to do with uh, essentially uh, which customers are being connected as as the grid grows. And we can see how this pattern is is uh, progressing. That as we as we get to newer and newer customers, we're reaching the edges of our current grid, and we're connecting uh, generally more rural, generally uh, lo lower income customers who uh, have fewer uh, appliances and consume less electricity. Could we advance the slide, please? Thank you. So uh, I want to also point out what the cost of this electricity is. So uh, this, is a, uh, this shows the tariff that these customers are paying. And in many countries, as, as Frank rightly pointed out, uh, the, the cost to the customer is far below the cost that the utility has to pay to provide that electricity. Now, the, the tariff in, in Kenya is set up with this kind of three-tiered progressive structure that uh, has an advancing cost as you move, use more electricity. However, we're looking at median lines here, and each of these median lines for all of these rural customers are below the 50 kilowatt threshold of the first tariff block. That means that for each unit of electricity, these customers are paying about 9.5 U.S. cents per kilowatt hour. Uh, in addition to this, they pay $1.50 per month fixed charge. So if we're looking at a customer with uh, 40, uh, a 30 kilowatt hour a month fee, that means that they're paying this $1.50 a month fixed charge plus 9.5 cents times that 30 kilowatt hour. So roughly about $3.50, or sorry, um, 30 plus times 10, yeah, so roughly about $4.50 total for that entire month's electricity bill. Can we advance to the next slide, please? So you can actually advance all the way through and bring up all of the bullet points on this slide. Thank you. So what are the implications of this? So we're looking at grid customers here, and we're seeing those typical bills are around 3 to $5 per month. Now, um, that 3 to $5 per month is, is essentially what the utility can use to recover the cost of that connection. And utilities uh, often across the continent offer varying uh, prices to customers uh, based on policy for how much that connection actually Cost. So in Kenya, for example, the, the cost is about $150 that's available to most customers for getting a new connection. However, on the other side of that is the cost that the utility bears for putting out the, the wires and poles and, and all the transportation costs involved in, uh, in, in installing that connection. And so that cost across Kenya is averaging about $1,200. US So the utility pays $1,200. The customer pays $150, which is often financed. And then that remaining over $1,000 in this case is borne by whom? It's often borne by the government. It's often borne by uh, foreign uh, multilateral donors and, and things like that. And so this, th these are often coming in loans. But ultimately, this cost needs to get paid for somehow. And this represents some of the insolvency challenge that uh, Frank introduced in the, uh, in the earlier slides. So one common strategy that's used to, to uh, account for this, this discrepancy between the cost of the utility and the cost to a customer is really some cross-subsidization that, that looks at how we can uh, use uh, income coming from larger customers, often industrial customers or higher, higher consuming customers, to offset these costs of investment into the grid. However, Kenya has about 3,500 industrial customers. And the grid needs to connect the next 5 million connections, so 5 million more connections. And there simply are not enough industrial customers. That would be on the order of 1,500 customers per industrial customer, 1,500 residential customers, the cost of all of those connections per industrial customer. Uh, and that essentially means about a million and a half U.S. dollars per industrial customer 
just recovered via their electricity bills. Now, that's a lot of electricity bills. Uh, and not only that, that's the profit from those electricity bills, so um, minus the cost of actually providing that electricity. So we see some significant challenges here with the grid model. If we can advance to the next slide. What does this look like for mini grids? So uh, Henry shared some excellent data from a set of mini grids across Kenya. Uh, I actually have some data to share from mini grids across Kenya and Tanzania that uh, looks at some of the same questions. What is consumption like on these mini grids? If we try this different model of uh, of using a distributed source and and uh, possibly keeping somewhat lower standards or somewhat different standards and reducing the cost of those connections, how much better can we do? Uh, if we could advance to the next slide. So uh, this is data from 11 mini grids across East, Af across East Africa, across Kenya and Tanzania, and looks at the monthly kilowatt hours per customer. So this is the same uh, quantity that we were looking at for uh, our previous slides where we saw that the median customers were in the roughly 20 to 30 kilowatt hours per month range. And so here we're seeing that uh, most of these grids are actually far below that. We see a mean of around seven kilowatt hours per month and a median around two and a half kilowatt hours per month. So we're talking about one tenth of that other median we saw for, for rural customers. And most of these customers, if not all of these customers, are going to be rural as well. So we see that mini grid customers consume much less than grid customers. And this has to do with uh, the, the price of electricity. So the, the grids here were operated by uh, an operator that's, op that's a private organization that is attempting to uh, operate these grids at, uh, at a, uh, essentially either flat or a slight profit. And so the cost of electricity that they offer is far beyond usually uh, in the $1.50 to $1.80 per kilowatt hour range. So quite high, but that's actually what they need to do in order to recover their costs efficiently. If we could advance to the graph, uh, the, the other challenge here is thinking about growth. So uh, this is a graph that looks at the growth in electricity consumption from when these, these 11 grids started. And if we stay on that 1.0 line, the dashed line we see in the, in the bottom of the graph, that is a, a grid that has not grown from the first month of consumption. Um, but what we see as a pattern here is that uh, most grids stay in the one to two range, as in they, don't, they, they double over, these, uh, over the two and a half years that are represented in this graph at most. But many of them actually don't show very much growth at all. They're actually staying uh, at less than one and a half, and some of those grids actually shrink their consumption after um, after their, their first month. And so this challenge of how do we, we get these customers to not only um, uh, improve their, their economic standing, but also improve their electricity consumption so that these grids can, can sustainably uh, exist and, and sustainably grow in these communities is, is a severe challenge. And this is, um, this is uh, one of the, the big challenges for the industry and for microgrids in, in general. Next slide, please. So what does this mean and what can we do? So uh, this growth and essentially it's, it's uh, flatlining that happens after a short number of years, it cannot sustain utilities and micro-utilities. Uh, whether you're the grid, whether you're a microgrid, you need customers to consume more of electricity, you need customers to buy more of your product to actually cover your costs. So the question is, as a, as a grid planner, as somebody thinking about how we can provide electricity access to the largest number of people and end up with the best impacts from providing energy, um, how can we best set up this, this system? Uh, and we have a, a, a slew of tools at our disposal now, whereas it used to be uh, just grids. Um, now we have mini grids. We have the ability to bring uh, solar home systems and solar lighting uh, systems uh, that, that can bring to bear a lot of improvements on these, on these systems. Uh, the question is how we can best deploy those resources. So one idea is actually uh, doing better targeting of customers. So if we think about each of those lines we, we showed, they're actually all distributions. And if you're able to, in advance, best understand which customers are the most likely to consume more electricity, you can better target the, the type of electricity system that is, that's available for those customers. So you could imagine uh, if, you, if you knew that a customer was going to be a, a fairly low consuming customer, then you could initially uh, begin with a lower uh, cost 
a source of electricity access like a home solar system or even a solar lighting system. However, if you knew in advance that a customer was going to be a higher consuming customer, then you could spend the uh, large amount of money, the 1200 US dollars necessary to uh, get a grid connection to those customers. And so really doing better targeting of individuals rather than just targeting communities as a whole is, is a way to uh, balance the, the heavy costs of providing these systems. And if you get that estimate wrong, it's simply adding that grid connection later. Now, um, one of the challenges though is how can we actually lower the cost of those mini grids and grid connections? I believe our next uh, speaker will talk quite a bit more about this topic and, and ways to, to really look at those costs. But this is a significant challenge. There's, uh, there's a, lot of look at the, a lot of people looking at this. What I'll say is that uh, one, one important uh, factor here is that most of that cost is, is tied up in in poles and wires. That's about 70% of that. So uh, reducing the cost of those is uh, challenging because they're not seeing the same sort of exponential decreases that we saw in solar that we are hoping to see in batteries as well. Absolutely. So uh, as a researcher, what I can offer is uh, what are some good further research topics in this area? And so um, one is really to understand how we can best stimulate economic growth with electricity. Second, uh, I want to uh, discuss how prepaid meters affect consumption here. Poor reliability hinders consumption. Having a, a poor grid connection can, can be an uh, enormous deterrent to people consuming electricity. Fourth is looking at technologies for reducing the cost of connections. And fifth is really understanding what the elasticity of demand is. As you change the price, how much power do people use? Next slide, please. Great, so thank you all very much. Uh, a short plug, I am always looking for strong PhD students who want to better understand the research methods that we can use for improving electricity access and reliability in Sub-Saharan Africa. And I also want to acknowledge uh, some colleagues, Simone Fobi at and Vijay Modi at Columbia and Nathan Williams and Paulina Jaramillo at Carnegie Mellon University. Thank you. Thanks, Professor Tanesha. A great job on uh, kind of giving us uh, an overview of the challenges of operations and specifically on the finance side of, of making these grids work over time. That's, that's really interesting data. With that, we're going to pass it over to our final panelist, Omer Ghani, is an entrepreneur with a passion for enabling energy independence, energy access, and eliminating the impact of climate change. He's the CEO of Kilowatt Labs. So, Omer, take it away. Thank you, Frank. Uh, good day, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and to talk about the many challenges that we're facing uh, in uh, electrifying Africa. Um, thank you, uh, Henry and Jay, for your very meaningful um, presentations. They are, uh, 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 address a lot of the issues that we face as we move forward. Um, our company is based in New York City. But uh, our uh, inventions were done in Dubai. We had a lab in Dubai. Our founder is uh, based in Dubai currently, uh, the inventor. He's from Pakistan, as am I. In fact, I'm calling in from Pakistan right now. I happen to be here on a business trip. Um, and we have a lab in Dubai. We have a factory that's uh, producing our product uh, in China. Uh, and our first installations, in fact, have been in South Africa. South Africa, uh, we have a very uh, uh, good uh, partner there. We've established, uh, we've uh, installed some of some of our battery technology there, and very shortly we'll be installing some very good microgrids. So that's a bit about us. Uh, I just want to get into uh, uh, what uh, we actually do. Next, next slide, please. Okay. So we believe that electricity access in Africa can be delivered by building microgrids that are based on 100% renewable generation, i.e. without dependence on fossil fuels and, and the grid. Um, and we believe that the commercial challenges of doing this uh, can be addressed with the right kind of technology. Uh, you know, uh, the business models uh, depend on the output of technology, which is the output of electricity and the cost of generating that as, as uh, uh, Jay and Henry have, have, have explained. Um, so we, when we just started developing this, uh, these products uh, a few years ago, uh, we, we did that with this in mind, that we wanted to de de develop a system or a solution uh, uh, where, whereby we could generate independent power that could compete with uh, fossil fuel energy, of course, and, and the grid in a lot of cases. Now, so, uh, and then functionally and technically, uh, our solution, which consists of two of our main products, which is the server and the storage, 
uh, operates or delivers functionality just like the grid, where you flick the switch and the lights turn on. You don't have to worry about load leveling, you don't have to worry about uh, etc. Because at the end of the day, access to affordable 20 Our power is the central resource citizen uh, uh, and everything. Next slide, please. Okay, so of, of how the system works, we actually make two products. One is the Centauri Energy Server, and I'll explain what that does in the subsequent slides. And we make a Cirrus, the Cirrus uh, battery bank. This is a battery bank that's made from supercapacitors. It's the first battery, non-chemical battery bank that's made from super caps. So essentially, we connect the server and the storage together with the uh, PV panels. Um, and uh, 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 because of the architecture of the server, the PV panels, uh, you know, they generate sunlight for four to six hours a day. Uh, this, uh, the, the sizing of the PV panels is such that uh, this, uh, they, are, they are generating enough energy for 24 hours so that energy is generated, uh, fed into the server. The server then first directly feeds the load, uh, which is quite different from uh, basic microgrid design because um, uh, normally uh, PV panels uh, feed the batteries and then the batteries uh, go in and service the load because of, of the, the requirement of handling uh, surge currents. But in, in the server, that's, that's not required. So there's a lot of savings, uh, a lot of optimization. Uh, so the panels generate uh, electricity during the day. The first thing the server does is supply to the load directly, and then any excess energy, it uh, charges the battery back. Uh, this happens for four to six hours a day, which is the sun hours or seven hours, whatever it is. And then uh, when, when the uh, panels stop generating, the server automatically switches to the batteries and starts supplying the load, and this circle is repeated uh, uh, every day. This grid on the left is actually a symbol for a redundant source. So the server can connect uh, the many sources. And, and if you have the grid, so the grid is connected there as a redundant source. And it's for days where the panels have not been able to generate enough electricity uh, uh, for 24 hours. So this is just a very simple uh, overview of, of how the system works. Next slide, please. Um, uh, the, the another very simple slide uh, the, the uh, centauri and, and cirrus uh, based microgrid uh, can be installed to run uh, communities critical facilities military bases it can be in a in a home or in a in a uh, in a uh, residential community it can run factories it can run offices and of course rural communities agriculture mining sectors islands etc cetera, etc cetera. basically it can operate as a utility uh, if required, or it can be a home system as required. It has the flexibility to scale uh, between the two extremes very easily. Next slide, please. Okay, so uh, how does a microgrid look with a kilowatt-based uh, system? First of all, uh, these, these microgrids can run on 100% renewable generation. So you can have PV panels, the server, and the storage bank connected to the load, and that's all you need. Um, because of uh, a lot of its functionalities, it is designed to operate every single device at the customer site, unlike existing systems that are functionally restricted to operating critical items only. For example, motors and pumps are very difficult. A uh, lot of oversizing is required if uh, uh, you know motors and pumps have to be run, but not with the server-based system. So uh, it is a very simple uh, connection to the customer's load, uh, and it can run the entire load. Then it's a very simple uh, plug-and-play system, so you, uh, the customer or the installer does not have to buy any additional equipment. Uh, you just have to connect the PV panel to the server, the battery to the server, and you connect the output to the main distribution board of the customer and start the system. So the installation is easy, it's fast, it's expensive, it eliminates lines of failure, and it's um, it's uh, it's inexpensive rather, and it's uh, it's you know it's very easy to do. So uh, it can be done very quickly. 
the battery has a life of one million cycles, does not require any maintenance, and uh, it, you know has the uh, uh, robustness to operate in very harsh environments and, and temperatures. It is because it's non-chemical, it is safe and non-toxic. Toxic. Because of all these reasons, the entire system operates in minimal supervision. This is a very critical requirement for electrification in Africa. It is a very critical requirement for electrification in Africa, uh, where uh, maintenance and operations are are are, are very very difficult uh, to perform if because of the distances involved. So uh, any uh, it can be monitored remotely and controlled remotely, and it can be managed with the, with, uh, with, the, with, the, uh, with very little supervision. Next slide, please. Okay, so let me get into uh, what the actual products are. The energy server is a power electronics hardware and software platform that controls and operates the microgrid and it delivers all the functionalities required to generate and distribute electricity from 100% renewable generation. So what are some of the key differentiating factors? Uh, first of all, uh, because uh, you, in order to generate 24 hour power in, in uh, five to six hours, uh, the PV sizing has to be four to five times. Uh, in uh, normal systems, you actually need four to five times the inverters. Uh, you have to oversize the inverters but with the server, you don't have to oversize it. So, for example, a five kilowatt server, you can connect um, 30, uh, you know, 20 to 30 kilowatts of panels. So, this is a, a, a very important feature of the, of the server. Secondly, um, it has the ability to handle uh, torque load. Uh, it can handle up to 1,000 percent for two seconds, uh, which enables the um, uh, the, the load to operate, uh, to, to the customer to operate any load so they can start uh, motors, pumps, uh, uh, compressors, refrigerators, anything, uh, uh, air conditioners that uh, have starting surge currents every time they start without actually oversizing the inverter, which is part of the service system. So, uh, this is a very important quality in, 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 in uh, um, making the installation and running the entire system and the customer load uh, very uh, seamlessly and easily. Uh, then it, uh, it has plug and play co connectivity of either a super cap based battery, which is what we produce, or a lead acid uh, uh, family of batteries or lithium ion families. This further reduces cost because you don't have to buy a battery inverter or a battery management system. It's a you just connect the battery bank to the server. The server has the appropriate module to manage the battery system. Then there's a switching because different sources are being used. Uh, this is a very important function as well because uh, uh, it provides redundancy uh, and, and it handles the intermittency of renew, uh, renewable generation, uh, delivering stable output. There's a bus bar architecture which delivers uh, switching between sources as far as the load is concerned in 0, 0.0 millisecond. Uh, finally, uh, it can take up to eight inputs, DC or AC, without uh, any uh, requirement for additional equipment. So you can connect, uh, you know, PV or wind. Um, uh, you can connect to the grid. You can connect a diesel generator or multiple diesel generators. And the system can be programmed to deliver sequential power or blended power. Um, and finally, uh, it, it has remote access uh, capabilities, so you can monitor it, you can log it, you can control the operations remotely as long as there's a, uh, internet. Um, next slide, please. Okay, the Cirrus Energy Storage is a, the first super cap based energy storage uh, that eliminates the challenges associated with chemical storage. Um, uh, basically, uh, we use super caps as our storage media. So we connect super assembly of super caps uh, in series and parallel, and uh, uh, you have a, our technology is the control algorithms and the, the circuitry that controls the super caps, uh, and and then our our super cap based modules then deliver performance like chemical batteries. Um, 
I saw a comment about uh, using supercaps uh, as batteries. That's exactly what we do. We have uh, uh, we have developed. We have overcome the limitations that supercaps have in actually delivering performance like a battery. Uh, I can get into that in the Q and A, but right now I'll restrict myself to the serious empty storage where it does really. Um, so it has because it's supercap based. It has a very high DC to DC efficiency, and it can be cycled 100% DOD, uh, which allows for um, uh, you know optimization of panel design because you're not uh, uh, losing energy in round trip efficiency, and you're not cycling um, you're not cycling uh, uh, fully. Uh, then uh, again, another very important aspect, which is again based on the attributes of the supercap, is that the rate of charge, the 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 the, the capacity and the life cycle of uh, the supercaps are, or the modules, supercap based modules are not affected by the rate of charge, which allows again optimization of panels because you can. Uh, charge the storage bank. The, 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 the sun comes out, and within one one and a half hour, the the, the modules are charged because our uh, st um, solar-based uh, storage modules are um, designed for two C charge cycle, uh, two C uh, rate of charge. Then, uh, because again, supercaps have uh, great uh, temperature tolerance, so between minus thirty centigrade and 85 degrees centigrade you don't need auxiliary cooling or heating uh, again this saves uh, a lot of uh, money uh, in terms of uh, aug uh, having to install auxiliary systems uh, and also uh, in terms of providing power to those auxiliary systems and finally all supercaps have 1 million cycle life so our supercap based energy storage devices uh, uh, also deliver that kind of cycle life next slide please Okay, so what does this mean for uh, uh, um, what does this mean for uh, microgrids? Uh, well, what it means is that uh, uh, P, uh, microgrids that are based on the Centauri and Cirrus uh, systems, along with PV solar, can uh, be effectively deployed across a variety of use cases and business models. Um, the actual uh, system uh, regarding cost. So when you install a system that's PV solar Centauri series based to give you 24 hour power just on PV solar, uh, depending on the level of sunshine, if you're getting at least five, five hours a day for most of the year, uh, it, should, it generates electricity anywhere between 20 to 25 cents per kilowatt hour for the life of the system, which is 25 years because we are limited by the life of the panels. Um, and, and that is achieved by uh, the fact that if everything is optimized, uh, you know, you don't have to oversize the inverters, you don't have to oversize the battery banks, you don't have to buy multiple systems and connect them together. Um, so then um, uh, you have, uh, you, have uh, 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 you know, very optimal sizing, which reduces the cost. Um, and then uh, because the Cirrus is a, is, is a super cap based system, uh, uh, there is no, uh, you know, there's no chemical battery attached to it. It's a, it's a, you know, it's based entirely on super. Uh, there is a load replacement cost. Uh, uh, um, again, all this leads to portability because technology eliminates oversizing, replacement, disposal, uh, disposal result in affordable electricity, and then allows a lot of different kinds of business models to be uh, implemented. And finally, it has uh, allowed because you're using 100% based renewable uh, generation, it uh, eliminates the need for fossil fuel. Uh, fossil fuel systems can be attached to them for redundancy for the you know out of 365 days, if you have to run them for 10% of the time, it it significantly reduces the G, uh, you know greenhouse gases. Next slide, please. A simple overview, it can be used in all applications, for industrial, healthcare, agriculture, education, residential, commercial, uh, telecom, hoarding. In fact, we have a big project with the MTN, which is South Africa's biggest telecom. They are using our storage modules to replace lead acid 
um, uh, batteries. Next slide, please. This is a picture of the energy server, and this is a 160 kilowatt machine. Next slide, please. And this is a picture of uh, some of our storage banks. The one at the bottom is a 3.55 kilowatt hour 48 volt uh, module. The one on the right top is a 7.1 kilowatt hour 48 volt module. And the one on the left is, um, it was a, a 1.3 kilowatt hour module, which uh, is now uh, uh, being deployed in various places. And uh, that's the last slide. Thank you very much. All right, thank you, Omer. Thank you to all of our panelists. I'm hearing uh, some some quiet applause in my head um, for for the contributions of each of the panelists today. And uh, and with that, I'd like to um, get uh, into Q and A. So um, a lot of folks are typing a bunch of questions into the Q and A for us, um, and some folks are even an answering questions now into the chat. Um, but uh, the the Q and A window, I'm just going to take some of these questions as we go through one one uh, a couple a couple quick ones um, somebody asked um, please define uh, non-technical line losses um, maybe uh, Henry you could take that one uh, I'm, so, I'm sorry can, can you repeat that Frank uh, just somebody's asking to define non-technical line losses Oh yeah, sure. Uh, not non-technical line losses are uh, generally associated with theft, so that, hence the the non-technical aspect of it. Yeah. It can be very large in in many countries. Uh, India, for example, is one of the more notorious countries for uh, non-technical line losses. Yes, absolutely. Um, and and that that has a lot to do. Somebody else had asked um, a question. Uh, what are the main um, causes of the insolvency that, that, that I referred to in, my, in one of my slides um, at the very beginning? Um, and, and according to the report by the World Bank, um, the, the four main causes are uh, underpricing, um, basically pricing at a subsidized rate that doesn't cover the fuel cost or the cost recovery. Uh, second would be transmission and distribution losses. That's both the technical and non-technical losses that Henry just spoke of as well as bill collection losses. Um, you know, in some countries, the, even the energy that's not stolen that is billed, the bill collection rates are below 50%. And then uh, overstaffing, which is basically hiring uh, large numbers of people in, in regions where, you know, perhaps um, a more, more efficient operation could have fewer fewer people. Um, the uh, Another question uh, from the from the audience here is, is who is developing the standards for AC and DC microgrids? Um, I guess uh, any of our panelists could take that one. Yeah, sure, I can take a stab at that. <clears throat> so there are a couple of organizations now that are working on standards for, for microgrids. In fact, uh, IEEE and IEC actually have some uh, that already exist. And, uh, but, but I think there's been some criticisms as to whether or not these are exactly appropriate for you know de the developing uh, country context, so uh, IEC is working on a low voltage uh, DC standard as we speak, as is IEEE. And if you want to know more about those efforts, you can uh, maybe contact me directly, and I can get you hooked up with the groups uh, working on those. Great. Um, I also noticed somebody asked a question in the in the Q and A for for. Jay regarding his uh, data, and Jay, you, you went ahead and put a link in the Q&A box. Um, could you explain what you did there? Uh, a question regarding what? I'm sorry, it cut out for a second. Okay, yeah, it looks like you posted a link to our participants in the Q&A window. Was that in response to a question? That was. So that is data from the World Bank's uh, look. It was the uh, slide that had the two maps of the continent, and it was data looking at rural and uh, urban electrification. I, I will say just generally, one of the challenges here is data, uh, getting accurate data, and also knowing how your data were collected. So, uh, you know, you can find these different sources, whether it's from the World Energy Outlook or World Bank or other sources for these data, but they often tend to be aggregated at you know, country scale and can have tremendous amount of, of error in, in how they're collected if you actually follow the process. Um, and so there's, these data should really be a guide to begin your, your study, but if you really want to understand what's happening, it's important to be on the ground, it's important to work with the people that actually collect the data 
uh, that, that you're working with, whether it's in your organization or whether it's in another organization. But um, it's hard to get good narratives when you're working with aggregated data from other sources. Okay. And another question, I guess, perhaps for Jay or, or, or maybe any of the panelists, the customers who haven't connected to the grid yet haven't developed consumption habits and may be more flexible in their behavior. Are you thinking of this in regards to demand response for microgrids? I thought this was a very insightful question. Uh, it's not just about, uh, so, you know, my, my normal thinking is that microgrids and, and smaller constrained grids uh, have uh, more benefit from demand response, more benefit from, from altering demand based on what's happening on the supply side uh, because they're constrained. Now, at the same time, your customers are actually more willing to, to deal with that flexibility as well. So I think that's a, a fantastic uh, observation from, um, uh, from the uh, participant, and uh, I think it's a very important point to realize. I actually have only seen uh, you, a small number of microgrids that have tried demand response, but it's still been fairly limited. So uh, it's something I'd love to see more, um, more uh, understanding of how useful and how effective demand response can be for uh, improving the, the financial sustainability of uh, these kinds of systems. Yeah, let me tack on. Go ahead. Let me tack on to that, if I if I may, um, because a lot of these mini grids are ultimately rely on on batteries. Any sort of demand response in terms of load shifting from the evening peak to during the day uh, can save a lot of money in the um, in, in how we design grids and, and the capital expense. So there's certainly an opportunity there. Um, there's also an opportunity in increasing the diversity of the load, trying to keep it less coincident. Most uh, data that I've seen that look at uh, residential consumers uh, of electricity, you know, the peaks all happen at 7 o'clock at night when the sun sets, everyone turns on their lights and their TVs, and there's not a lot of diversity. So you have to design your system around that peak, and you, you don't get much diversity. So ways that, creative ways of, of spreading the peaks around also would make a, a big difference, and there's a big opportunity there. Uh, great point. Yeah. And and I will quickly add here that uh, that Segura International, the company I happen to work for, does does have a, a proprietary smart meter that does enable the demand response and uh, the type of uh, type of flexibility that that folks are, are calling for here. Um, uh, going on to another question here uh, for Omer, the where are the Centuri Energy servers located? Are they central for each grid? Do you have multiple units distributed throughout the microgrid area? And then what is the what is the approximate pricing? We're getting some questions on that as well. If you are willing to share. Yeah, uh, actually, our uh, 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 product range starts at two and a half kilowatts and goes up, up to a megawatt. So. Uh, uh, the installations that we've done in uh, 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 in the Middle East and in Pakistan over the last two three years. Uh, this was before the server actually became uh, the server it is. It, it's the version uh, that we're using now. Uh, vary from two and a half kilowatts to about two hundred kilowatts, and uh, uh, they are uh, uh, at the site level. So uh, home, school, factory, commercial establishment, restaurant. Uh, you know, but all of uh, where these uh, companies or uh, individuals were using diesel and didn't have any electricity. So uh, 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 it can be sized uh, based on your load. Uh, it can be installed uh, either at a site or it can be installed for a community. If it's installed for a community, uh, it would be uh, connected to a distribution system so that it also it, uh, it behaves like a utility. And the pricing is about uh, 40 to 50 cents a watt for the server. But remember, with, when you buy the server, you don't have to buy anything else. You just have to buy the PV panels and you have to buy the uh, battery. Okay, great. Um, so one one last question, and I know people are people are really getting some good questions into this, into this question window. I'm going to, just based on time, we said we'd keep you for 75 minutes and we're at 74. So last question is going to be, um, the uh, somebody asked could could pre presenters discuss recent hurricanes and the re and the wisdom of replacing um, you know kind of grid as usual infrastructure um, specifically in island context uh, with these new microgrid models. So a question about resiliency. 
Uh, well, I, I, I would uh, install microgrids, uh, obviously, because they provide resiliency, they provide, uh, uh, you know, when, when you, when, especially in critical facilities, you, can, you need power. So these microgrids are, uh, uh, you know, very, very good for that. But the kind of devastation that's happened, uh, it's very difficult to uh, imagine PV panels or wind uh, generators uh, surviving. So uh, it's always uh, it's uh, it's difficult to if there was a microgrid there that's based on uh, you know PV, uh, it, it, they can't sustain. No installation is designed for 200 mile an hour winds, and that's one of the challenges that we have to uh, understand how to how to run a microgrid installation. Uh, do obviously need some input power, you know, have to have to have the generation source. And that's one of the things that we are always struggling with, especially in disasters. Jay or Henry, any, any last thoughts on, on, on uh, resiliency? Yeah, I'll just say that, um, I mean, I, I, I agree with, with Omer in that, uh, you know, uh, it's really hard to, to strengthen against a, a hurricane. Uh, there's always going to be sort of a cost component that you need to be aware of. So if you want an addition, additional resiliency and, and reliability and all those things, then uh, it usually comes at an added cost. So, um, you know, is it, is it economically feasible? In some cases, yes, it's worth it. And I think for some other consumers, perhaps no. And Jay, any thoughts? Uh, absolutely. I think that it's uh, – the, the challenge is – not necessarily what happens during the hurricane. It's very difficult to, to deal with those situations. It's about resiliency. It's about recovery, and uh, it's about how centralized that that process is. With Prepa in in uh, the utility in in Puerto Rico, that process is entirely centralized. They've hired contractors from uh, from Montana that are uh, a small organization that just doesn't have the manpower to to build a, to install the same grid that we had before. Now the challenge is. Uh, how do you make a decision in order to uh, fix up what was already there or take this opportunity to uh, redesign and re-architect the whole thing? And, and who gets to make that decision? That's a really, really a, a critical challenge that, that puts us in a spot at this, this point in time. But uh, building the same grid we built you know, 50 to 100 years ago is seldom the right answer. So this could be a crisis as an opportunity situation, but at the same time you have you know, millions of people in Puerto Rico suffering from a lack of electricity that – uh, there's no time for dithering. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And, and speaking speaking from my personal experience, I spent most of last month in, in Haiti during hurricane season, you know, making sure that the, the grids that Segura operates in, in Haiti were prepared and, and ready to in, endure the hurricane. So, fortunately, didn't take a direct hit, but there's been a lot of recent media coverage of the, the actions that we took um, to protect ourselves in, in that situation. And I have no doubt that, that microgrid infrastructure uh, is, is exactly what, what's needed, uh, in, in our case at least, um, for the, uh, for the uh, resiliency and the ability to bounce back. Um, so uh, with that, um, we're finished for today. Um, please, please go on, uh, uh, if you want to, uh, to ask additional questions or if your questions weren't answered, um, you can tweet them to us at the hashtag is E4C webinar. You can also email webinars at engineeringforchange.org and our panelists uh, will get back to you as well as the E4C staff. Um, as you can see on the last slide here, there's a PDH code for today's event. Um, go ahead and follow the link um, if, you, if you need PDH. Um, and don't forget to become an E4C member and get info on upcoming webinars. Um, so thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be part of the seminar. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Thank you all, and please don't hesitate to email us to uh, to connect and, and find out more about these topics. We appreciate it.